Welcome to the presentation of CSEC Multiple Choice Practice Paper 4. We will begin with the solution of the first 15 problems and this we will call Part A. What is the value of the digit 3 in the number 3241? The value of a digit in a number is dependent on two things. The first one is what we call the face value. The value of the digit itself is called the face value of the digit. And the second, the value that the digit has because of its position relative to the other digits. And that one is called its place value. So, the value of a digit in a number is dependent on two things. The face value, one, which is, of course, the value of the digit itself. And two, the value that it has because of its position relative to other digits that are in the number. Let us first place the number in question under the microscope. So we have our 3,241. Let us take note of all of the place values of the digits in the number. So put the place values in. We have thousands, hundreds, tens, and ones. The value of a digit in a number is equal to the product of its place value and its face value. Write down the face value first. So we will write down the face value. This is the face value 3. That goes first. Then we will multiply by the place value. And we have as its place value thousands. So we imagine that we will multiply by 1000. So multiply by the place value. The 3 is in the position of a thousand so we will multiply by a thousand so three multiplied by one thousand that is equal to three thousand and that is the value of the digit three in the number the correct answer is option D zero point seven five written as a common fraction is decimal fractions are all fractions whose denominators are powers of 10. The number of decimal places tell us the power of 10 concerned. There we have 0 0.75 and we need to take a look at the number of decimal places that we can already see is 2. So we have one, two places of decimal. The number of decimal places is two. The power of ten that we divide by is ten to the power of two or ten squared, which is equal to one hundred. The fraction is therefore the equivalent of seventy five divided by one hundred. The fraction may be reduced by a common factor of 25. 25 into 100 is 4 and 25 into 75 is 3. The correct answer is option C. 3 quarters. You may reduce the fraction in any way convenient to you. If you are more comfortable reducing the fraction by 5 each time, then do it. If you can see a reduction by 25, then there is no harm progressing in that manner. In the sequence 1, 6, 13, 22, 33, the next term is... Let us determine that next term. Let us write down the terms that are already given. We have them right there. Let us put them under the microscope also. 
we have 1, 6, 13, 22, 33. There they are. There does not seem to be any obvious pattern linking consecutive terms in the sequence. In such a case, we proceed to find the difference between consecutive terms. There is no obvious pattern, so find the difference between consecutive terms. 6 minus 1 is equal to 5, goes there. 13 minus 6 is equal to 7, there we have it. 22 minus 13 is equal to 9. And finally, 33 minus 22 is equal to 11. And I'm sure that by now we should see a pattern developing right here. We see that the difference is increasing by 2 each time because we have 5. When we add 2 to it, we get 7. Then 7 plus 2 is equal to 9. Then 9 plus 2 is equal to 11. What do we imagine? The next difference we expect to be 13. So we expect 5, 7, 9, 11 to go up by 2 more. We expect 13. 13 will be the difference between 33 and and the next term. The next term will be 33 plus 13. And that is equal to 46. 46 is represented by option C. Good. So what we have done, we have determined that the difference or the differences here they are increasing by 2 each time. So what do we do? We ensure that for the final one, we increase that one by 2 also. Then, we are saying that to get from 33 to the next number, we need to have a difference of 13. Applying that 13, we get 46. There is no harm in that one. What transformation maps triangle PQR onto P prime, Q prime, R prime? Any candidate that is familiar with his transformation will be able to tell that we have a reflection with the mirror line positioned about right there. There we have it. Any candidate that is familiar with transformation should look at this and say okay that's a reflection and the mirror line should be located round about that spot as we have it right there such a candidate will not have any problem realizing that the correct answer is option B The transformation is not a translation because in a translation, the object and the image are actually the same with the only exception that they are at different locations. So everything about the image of a translation will be the same as the original, exactly the same as the original. Only that it is at a different location. We do not have that happening right there. We are sure that this transformation is not a translation. There is no evidence of enlargement since there is no discernible difference in size. So there is no difference in the size of this one and this one. So we are sure that we are not talking about an enlargement or any size transformation for that matter. The physical appearance of the object and the image support both rotation and reflection. However, there is a single difference between object and image that places the correct transformation beyond question. By looking at these two, if at sight this is an isosceles triangle 
and this is an isosceles triangle then we have no problem seeing that that transformation could be represented by a rotation also as a matter of fact just by looking at it it will be difficult to tell that it is not a rotation but we are not only looking at the physical appearance in this particular case of the two triangles we are considering something else let us take a look on the next slide first read the letters P Q R on the object and take note of the direction in which they are read clockwise or anticlockwise so we have P Q R P Q R we are going in an anticlockwise direction P Q R in an anticlockwise direction next read the letters P prime Q prime R prime on the object and take note of the direction in which they are read clockwise or anticlockwise so P prime Q prime R prime P prime Q prime R prime so this one is going in a clockwise direction in this one we went in an anticlockwise direction we see that the letters P Q R were read in an anticlockwise direction while the letters P prime Q prime R prime were read in a clockwise direction the directions are different because of this we say that the object and its image are different in orientation a difference in orientation is associated with reflection only this confirms that the transformation is actually a reflection the difference in orientation is caused by what we call lateral inversion the mirror line acts like a crease or the middle of a book with transparent pages the triangle is drawn on one page the page containing the triangle is flipped or we just turn the page the result is an example of lateral inversion so imagine that you have a triangle drawn on the transparent page of a book what do you do next you turn the page that contains the triangle what you will observe is an example of lateral inversion which will be the effect of reflection on an object we have 2a cubed to be multiplied by 3a squared first we need to multiply the coefficients we are hard the coefficients 2 and 3 multiplying those we get 6 when multiplying numbers letters in this particular case that have the same base we add the indices we intend to add the indices of the A's one of the occurrences of A is not accompanied by an index the value of the index that we assume in this case is 1 so we need to add the indices of the A's but this one is not accompanied by an index the value of the index in this case is 1 according to the laws of indices when we multiply numbers with the same base we add the indices so let us add them we have 3 plus 1 a to the power of 3 plus 1 finally simplify the result and we will get 6a to the power of 4 the correct answer is option C in this particular problem 
we need to square a fraction. We have a fraction to square. In squaring a fraction, we square the numerator and then square the denominator, resulting in 2 squared over 3 squared. Any number that is squared is multiplied by itself. So let us do that. Multiply each one by itself. Finish up by simplifying the result. 2 times 2 is 4 and 3 multiplied by 3 is equal to 9. So we have 4 ninth. The correct answer is option D. If P is equal to the set 2, 3, 5, 6, Q is equal to the set 2, 3, 6, and S is equal to the set 2, 4, 5, then P intersection, Q intersection, S, P intersection, Q intersection, S is equal to what set? The statement of the problem is soliciting the intersection of all three sets. The intersection of the three sets is the set of elements that are present in all three sets or the set of elements common to the three sets. The element 2 is common to all three sets and there is no other. Right. We cannot see another that is present in all three sets. There is no other element with the same characteristic under these circumstances. The correct answer is option B. Let us attempt to use a Venn diagram in order to solve the problem. We have the three sets included. Overlapping each other demonstrating that they have an intersection. When inserting information into a Venn diagram, the elements of the intersection of all three sets go first. So the element that is present in all three sets will go first. That is the intersection. All of those elements in the intersection, we will place them in the Venn diagram first. There is nothing else because only the intersection of the three sets is needed. Nothing else. We do not need to include anything else. We only need the intersection of all three sets and we have it right there. Which of the following sets is equivalent to the set A, B, C, D. What do we mean by equivalent? If two sets A and B are equivalent, then there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of A and B. All this requires is that the two sets have the same number of elements, and we may write that as N A is equal to N B. Therefore, if we can identify the set in this particular case that has the same number of elements as the one in the statement of the problem, our work is done. So all we need to do is identify the set in the options that has the same number of elements as the one in the statement of the problem because all that equivalence requires is that they have the same number of elements. That is the one, option C. The correct answer is option C. If set A is equivalent to set B, we will write, write it like that with the equivalence sign. Be careful to know that equivalence does not require that the elements of the two sets are the same. That is the requirement of equality. So we 
know that the two sets are equivalent if they have the same number of elements. And this is how we express equivalence. The product of a number P and its reciprocal may be written as a product is the result of multiplication. We need to write the product of P and something else, which is of course its reciprocal. Let us prepare for this. We need the product of P and something else. The product is the result of multiplication, so we have P multiplied by something which is, of course, its reciprocal. What we need to multiply P by is its reciprocal. Another name for reciprocal is multiplicative inverse. The reciprocal of a number is formed by dividing 1 by that number. We will therefore multiply by 1 over P. The correct answer is option D. If we have a number like P or 5 or 7 and we need to form its reciprocal we do that by dividing 1 by that number so 1 divided by P is the reciprocal of P the correct answer is option D as we stated before when forming the reciprocal of a vulgar fraction the numerator and denominator exchange places. Vulgar fraction. Do its reciprocal by exchanging the places of the numerator and the denominator. There is your vulgar fraction. Let us form its reciprocal. It's as easy as that. Right. If A is equal to 4 and K is equal to 3, then negative A all raised to the power of K, what is that equal to? Let us rewrite the expression which is negative A all raised to the power of K. All we need to do is substitute the values of A is equal to 4 and K is equal to 3 into the expression. So where we see A, we write 4. Where we see K, we write 3. That's all there is to it. The power is 3. The base needs to be multiplied by itself 3 times. That is what we do. The power will tell us the number of times that we need to multiply the base by itself. So multiply the base by itself three times for the power of three. So we will have three occurrences of negative four multiplying together. Negative multiplied by negative is equal to positive. So we will have a positive 16 there, no doubt. And the next part will also follow. The remaining negative 4 is also included in the product. We cannot leave that one out. So what did we have? Negative multiplied by negative is positive 16. And do not leave out the remaining negative 4. We have multiplied by negative 4. Finally, we have negative multiplied by positive is equal to negative 16 4 64 negative 64 the correct answer is option B some candidates may be able to look at this statement of a problem and write the answer down they may be aware of the fact that 4 to the power of 3 is equal to 64 or they may be able to make the calculations mentally. They may also know that if a product contains an odd number of negative numbers, the answer will be negative. So if we are multiplying a lot of numbers and we have an odd 
number of negative signs the answer will be negative if we have an even number of negative signs the answer will be positive algebraic expression since each one of these is simpler than the one that we started off with we are sure that we need to simplify the algebraic expression in the statement of the problem in order to determine the correct answer this problem requires us to add or in this particular case subtract the algebraic terms in an expression which is a process of simplification the expression has like terms that may be combined when we have an expression like that sum or we may say a combination of addition and subtraction then we will combine the like terms where are the like terms let us combine the like terms if any well we are sure that the x's are like terms we will combine them 5x minus 3x is equal to 2x and do we have any more right negative 2y plus 2y 2y and negative 2y are additive inverses when we add them the result is 0 then all we need to do is add 0 to this 2x and we know that to anything that we add 0 the result will be that same thing there is no further addition to the expression and this is our correct answer which turns out to be option A a boy scored 60% in a test if the maximum marks possible was 80 how many marks did he score on the test some candidates may not hesitate to determine that what we need to do is multiply 80 by 60% which is merely finding 60% of 80 so some students will just do that automatically 80 multiplied by 60 percent 60 percent is equal to 60 out of 100 or 60 over 100 or 60 divided by 100 and that will give us 0 0.6 multiplying by 60 percent is the same as multiplying by 0 0.6 replacing the 60 percent with 0 0.6 80 multiplied by 0 0.6 as usual when multiplying decimal fractions we neglect the decimal places at first and just multiply so we will just have 6 to be multiplied by 80 we get 480 we then ensure that the answer has the same number of decimal places as the problem in the problem there is only one place of decimal the answer will therefore have only one place of decimal when we are multiplying decimal fractions just multiply as if there is no decimal place at the end we ensure that the answer has the same number of decimal places as the problem we have a single decimal place there the answer will have a single decimal place also that turns out to be 48 the correct answer is option B let us say that determining what to do was not as easy as we have made it out to be using knowledge and a simple line of argument should help we will take another approach to that same problem on the next slide first 
Let us take note of the fact that 60% is the same as the fraction 60 divided by 100 or 60 over 100. That is what 60% really is, a fraction whose denominator is 100. The maximum mark possible was 80. That 60% is the same as a certain number that we do not know. It is the same as a certain mark that we call X out of 80. So that X is out of 80. X out of 80 may be correctly written as X over 80. That mark out of 80 is equal to 60%. And that is what we have right there. A simple equation. Solving the equation for x may be achieved by eliminating 80 from the left-hand side. This will result in 80 being multiplied on the right-hand side. We are dividing by 80 here. Elimination requires that we multiply. The 80 will be eliminated from the left-hand side. We have multiplication by 80 on the right-hand side. And we will write that as a fraction also. The fraction may be reduced by a common factor of 100. And we like to do this, to reduce by a common factor of 1,100 or by 10. This may be achieved by striking off two zeros from the denominator and another two from the numerator. Cross off those two, cross off those two. That is what we generally do when we are reducing by a common factor of 100. 6 multiplied by 8 is equal to 48 because that's what is left. 6 multiplied by 8. We have confirmed that the correct answer is option B. Some of us already know the rule that they make for just such a situation. You cannot divide across an addition or subtraction sign. That is what we are always told. In mathematics, you may be liberal in solving any problem as long as your approach is legitimate. Here, we may simplify the expression by dividing each term in the numerator by 3 because we are actually dividing by 3. Let us take a look at that under the microscope. We have the same problem rewritten right here. 15x divided by 3 is equal to 5x and 12 divided by 3 is equal to 4 and we are done. But it is said that we cannot divide across a multiplication or subtraction sign. The correct answer is option D. There we have the expression again. What are we about to do with it? Generally, when we reduce a fraction, we do so by making use of a common factor. That is, a factor that is present in both numerator and denominator. And that is a general thing that we use each time that we are reducing a fraction. We look for a factor that is present in both numerator and denominator. And we say reduce the fraction by a common factor of 100 as we did not too long ago. Reduced by a common factor of 100 because a factor of 100 is present in the numerator and a factor of 100 is present in the denominator. So we need to, if we are reducing the fraction, to use the same principle. We may take a factor of 3 from the numerator. We have 3 in the denominator. We are saying that. Let us see if we can reduce this. We can. If we can find 
a factor of 3 in the numerator? We are sure that we can. Do our little factorization by saying what? 3 into 15x gives 5x. So we have 15x right here. And we are taking a common factor of 3. We say 3 into 15x is 5x. We'll go right there. Then what do we say? 3 into 12 gives 4. So 3 into 12 is 4. We have already taken out a common factor of 3. We may reduce the fraction by the common factor of 3. So, can only reduce if we have a factor in the numerator and that same factor is present in the denominator. And we have just such a situation right here. We will take out that 3 along with this 3, reducing by a common factor of 3. And the answer that we have left is 5x plus 4. That 5x plus 4 is our correct answer that we have right here, represented by option D. I imagine that the rule was given in order to guard students from making mistakes. For me, it is better for students to be aware of the mistakes that they are likely to make under the circumstances and mathematical principles that they may apply in order to overcome such possibilities. So we do not just make rule in order that students will follow them blindly. We make rules that are based on fundamental principles. Then we need to cause students to be aware of some mistakes that may be made under certain circumstances. Then we show them the mathematical principles that may be applied in order to overcome them. Here is a simple perfect square. But let us look at how it is possible for candidates to arrive at each incorrect answer. So we have a simple perfect square right here. And if we take the perfect square, and this is our approach, that is, neglecting the negative sign, a candidate may want to square A and square B. That's how they do. Square A, square B, they get A squared minus B squared. That is the one that we have there for option A. What will they do for option B? In squaring negative B, one candidate may realize that negative multiplied by negative is positive and they progress. And A squared plus B squared, which is of course another incorrect answer. Some candidates, like my students, are able to expand the perfect square mentally. Since you cannot read our minds, we will write down each step of the mental process. We can square this A minus B mentally. You cannot read our minds, so let us show you how we approach such a feat. What do we do first? Square the first. So we will call the first term in the bracket the first. And we will call the second one in the bracket the second. While considering first or second, the sign that accompanies that term must be taken into account. So square the first. When we square A, we get A squared. Then what do we say? Add twice the product of the first and the second. So we will have plus 2 times A times negative B. 2 times the first times the second. Finally, we say what? Square the second. 
square negative b we will get a positive b eventually but we are just writing down negative b all squared square the first two times the first times the second square the second good the middle term is negative because in it we have negative multiplied by negative the third and final term will be positive because we are squaring and when we square and multiply by itself negative multiplied by negative gives a positive it may be beneficial to have as a rule that the square of any number whether positive or negative is always positive right here we will replace this one a positive multiplied by a negative negative and the squaring we will get a positive that's all there is to it and the correct answer is option D here we will take a look at the entire process of expanding the perfect square squaring a number is the same as multiplying it by itself so we are squaring a number what do we do multiply that number by itself that's what we will do we say first a multiplied by a is a squared then what do we say a multiplied by negative b is negative a b after that we say negative b multiplied by a and that is also negative a b well we have negative b a there but that is the same as negative a b finally we say negative b multiplied by negative b is a positive b squared the two middle terms are like terms further when adding numbers or terms that have the same signs the values are added and the answer will take the same sign as in numbers or terms that we are adding we have negative a b minus a b they have the same sign add them and the answer will take the same sign as the ones that we have added we finally get a squared minus 2ab plus b squared which of course is the same thing that we have option D and we have it as being correct after all of this one may ask how could anyone possibly get option C as their answer the answer is quite simple this is the same way that we generally fail to accomplish greatness we conquer the difficult part and imagine that there is nothing else to the problem that can defeat us we think that we are home and dry when there is something simple that we have neglected to ensure that such a thing does not happen we need to exercise presence of mind throughout the entire process in order that we do not miss anything because if we think that we have the prize in our hand because of the great things that we have already accomplished at the moment that we are ready to grasp if we do not keep our focus we will grasp and grasp nothing at all so we need to keep our focus throughout the solution of the problem to ensure that every bit of detail is correct in the figure the shaded region can be represented by which one of these 
we may first determine if it is legitimate to supply a range of values for x or for y. Both of these cannot be correct. So which one is correct? Do we need to have a range of values for x or do we need to have a range of values for y? Notice that the values of x associated with the shaded region occupies the entire region allotted to the graph. We may therefore conclude that the values of x may continue indefinitely since no obvious bound is given. The expressions that include x may be eliminated. So A and B are incorrect. We will focus on C and D. We will investigate the one that is incorrect first. Negative 3 is greater than or equal to y is greater than or equal to negative 2, which is of course option D. The expression may be divided into its two constituents expressions. By separating like that, we have what? Negative 3 is greater than or equal to y, while y is greater than or equal to negative 2. This is saying that negative 3 is greater than y, and at the same time, y is greater than negative 2. This is an impossibility because let us see what will happen if we eliminate the y's. So let us throw away those y's and see what will happen. This is saying that negative 3 can be greater than negative 2, which is not true. The only option left is C. It is therefore the correct one. We have eliminated A and B because we are not talking about the range of values of X. So those two are out. We are talking about the range of values of Y. In this particular case, we have eliminated option D, which if we neglect this y, we are actually saying that it is possible that negative 3 is greater than negative 2. And we know that is not correct. Therefore, the only one that is left is option C. And it represents the correct answer. One of the greatest temptations is to say that a large negative value is greater than a small negative value. For example... On this occasion, negative 3 is greater than negative 2. Because 3 is greater than 2, we say that negative 3 is greater than negative 2. Remember that on a number line, the larger values are located to the right and the smaller values to the left. There we have a negative 2, there we have a negative 3. Taking note of the relative positions of the numbers on the number line demonstrates beyond a reasonable doubt that negative 2 is actually larger than negative 3 because the larger numbers are to the right. Since negative 2 is to the right of negative 3, we know that negative 2 is greater than negative 3. Option D is incorrect because in this expression, is implied that negative 3 is greater or can be greater than negative 2. We are saying can be greater because this sign does not mean greater. Neither this one does not mean greater. It means greater than or equal to. This one is greater than or equal to. But because of the greater than that is present, we are saying that it is saying that negative 3 can be greater than negative 2, which we know to be incorrect. And that eliminated option D. Further, if candidates will demonstrate familiarity with the jargon of mathematics and the way similar expressions are written on past CXE 
CSEC examination papers. They will not have any difficulty identifying option C as being correct in a few seconds. If you are familiar with your jargon and you are familiar with typical CXE CSEC questions, we always see the expression that we are looking for or expression that we are looking for expressions that are similar to it on past CXE CSEC examination paper. Take note of how often similar expressions appear every time that CXE is asking us to draw a graph. Bringing that knowledge forward could have helped in the solution of this problem.